So some of you may have already heard of a wireless protocol called LoRa and the underlying physical layer of the LoRa is proprietary. However, the rest of the uh, protocol is designed in an open source manner. And this protocol operates in the unlicensed frequency band, typically at sub gigahertz frequencies. So the LoRa protocol supports low data rate of between one to 20 kilobits per second, and it can transmit over very long distances at the order of few kilometers. Currently, LoRa is one of the most popular uh, uh, protocol that is being used to deploy low power wide area networks. And there is an active interest from both the academic uh, community as well as from the industry. So one of the considerations that make LoRa very different from the other, uh, uh, other protocols that we have uh, studied in the course is the specific modulation scheme that is employed. So LoRa uses a modulation scheme that is called chirp spread spe spectrum. So it is a spreading technique that helps to significantly improve the reliability and also allow support for co concurrent transmissions and also allows you to support very high transmission range. So if we look at this modulation, modulation scheme at a nutshell, the individual symbols in this modulation scheme, uh, scheme comprises of up chirps and down chirps. And these up chirps and down chirps are similar to what we show on the slide. It has a, a frequency that either increases or decreases with time, as we show on the slide. If it increases, it is called an up chirp. And if it goes down with time, it is called a down chirp. So an unmodulated chirp is only linearly increasing or decreasing uh, frequency with time. However, to modulate the chirp and encode data the, this information is typically contained in the starting and the ending point of the chirp. So as we see in the uh, in the figure presented on the slide, these abrupt changes uh, actually comprise the information that, uh, uh, that we need to transmit. So these abrupt changes contain the individual bits or uh, cluster of bits that uh, one particular chirp uh, carries, which are then wirelessly transmitted. So one of the important parameters in chirp spread spectrum modulation scheme is the spreading factor. It is essentially the rate of change of the frequency of the chirp. It can also be intuitively thought of as a slope or the frequency change in the chirps. So the lower the value of the spreading factor, the steeper the slope and the faster would be the data rate and vice versa. So one of the interesting property of the chirp spread spectrum modulation scheme is that the different spreading factors are orthogonal. And this is important because this can allow two transmissions to, or even more to overlap in time, space, and frequency, and yet they will not collide or interfere with each other. This is particularly important for uh, the low power wide area network because it can allow us to the scale the number of nodes in the deployed network uh, to a very significant number. And this is also one of the important reasons for the growth and the popularity of the LoRa network to enable city scale uh, uh, deployments. So how does the channel allocation for LoRa look like? One thing that you will note is that the, this protocol is very uplink focused. And this is because most of such wide area networks typically require offloading the sensor data from the device to the gateway or the edge device and not as much communication from the gateway or the edge device to the, uh, to the end node. So the, 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 the traffic is mostly from the sensor to the edge device. So consequently, if you look at the LoRa standard, there are 64 uh, 125 kilohertz wide uplink channels. Furthermore, there are over, uh, there are 500 kilohertz wide uh, eight downlink channel to enable communication from the gateway device to the end nodes. However, of course, this allocation is uh, for the United States and other parts of the world, the specific details might uh, differ uh, uh, about the number of channels that are available. So LoRa as a protocol supports different uh, data rate. And this depends upon the specific channel uh, being used and the spreading factor. So for example, uh, the, if we, uh, we talked about that there are 64, 105 kilohertz wide uplink channels and each of these channels can support a maximum data rate of five kilobits per second uh, for a, a specific uh, spreading factor. So how does the medium access control mechanism for the LoRa one protocol look like? One important thing to keep in mind is that uh, due to load bit rates, 
the packets can be very long in duration. So typically they could be few hundred milliseconds long uh, transmissions uh, over, over the air. So uh, another thing that we should keep in mind is that uh, this is something we had talked about in the earlier lecture is that performing clear channel assessment is not very reliable at very long distances. Hence, uh, considering all these factors, LoRa employs a medium access control mechanism that is very basic and it's an Aloha protocol to mediate access. So how does the downlink reception for LoRa when looks, uh, protocol looks like? The protocol supports three different device classes. For the first device class or the device class A, it uses the most energy efficient downlink mechanism. So these devices can receive download uh, messages in two short receive window right after they have uh, 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 transmitted uh, on the uplink. So as you can see from the slide, so uh, the node transmits and then it has two receive slots on which it can receive transmissions from the gateway device. And this uh, this is actually good for uh, energy efficiency perspective. And it's uh, this uh, downlink mechanism is good for battery power devices. The second class of devices is device B and they have an extra schedule or uh, receive window. These are not synchro. These are synchronized receive window. And uh, uh, this, me this uh, mechanism provides more opportunity for reception even without uh, uh, any uplink transmission. However, uh, it is in the networks that are typically deployed, it's not as much used uh, as co compared to the other downlink uh, mechanism. Finally, the uh, the third class of devices that LoRaWAN supports is the class C, and this is the least energy efficient uh, downlink uh, mechanism that it supports. And here, it had the devices have a continuous receive window uh, which they only close when they are on transmitting. So if the nodes are transmitting, that's the only time when the receive window is closed. Otherwise, it's always in the uh, in a mode where it can uh, receive transmissions from the edge or the gateway device. It is the least energy efficient, but provides a maximum downlink reliability. And uh, typically, this mode is useful for end devices that can be, for example, externally powered. So each of these downlink mechanisms in LoRaWAN differs in the, the trade-off between reliability, latency, and the energy efficiency. And the specific choice of this mechanism would depend upon the requirements of the IoT application and the constraint of the device on which it is being implemented. So how does the packet structure look like for the LoRaWAN? So we provide you an illustration with the figure on the slide. The maximum data payload uh, depends upon uh, the the uh, the data rate that uh, that is being used. So the, it, the it's it's not fixed across the protocol, but it uh, depends upon the specific data rate at which you are operating, and that defines the maximum payload that you can send. Typically, uh, if you look if you look at the the how the topology of the network looks like, typically the LoRaWAN is organized uh, in a network that is similar to what we show on the slide. The end devices transmit their data to the gateway, and these gateways then they take this uh, data uh, and communicate it to cloud or other other such uh, servers by uh, using a backhaul uh, network. And typically, these end devices. Uh, uh, or uh, typically are, are communicating to gateways that are listening to the entire bandwidth simultaneously, which can be 12 megahertz for some parts of the world. And typically there is no synchronization between these gateways and the end devices. So if you look at just the link characteristic, typically the transmit power of a LoRaWAN transmitter is between 20 to 30 dBm. So it's actually quite significant and which when combined together with high sensitivity at the receiver and for the, the highest spreading factor, that means the lowest data rate, this sensitivity can be as high as minus 146 dBm. Just compare it to things like Bluetooth or uh, Zigbee, where the, uh, it's about uh, 40 to 50 dB higher than the sensitivity of a uh, Bluetooth or a Zigbee uh, receiver. Consequently, because of these characteristics, it gives LoRa van extre extremely high range, especially when we compare to the uh, standards such as Bluetooth or Zigbee that are commonly used on IoT devices. And we can communicate over range easily of hundreds of meters to few kilometers using a LoRa van network. So one great thing about LoRa networks is that uh, it's uh, it can operate on the unlicensed band, and you can easily buy off-the-shelf hardware that costs just few dollars to tens of dollars, and you can interface uh, your devices with these LoRa trans uh, transmitters, 
and design your own network and do all these uh, wireless communication experiments. So uh, in that respect, uh, it, uh, it's, it's, it allows you to sort of like easily prototype your applications. And that has been one of the major reasons for its popularity and growth. So as we had seen that the gateway devices uh, can uh, receive data from a number of LoRa nodes that are deployed in the uh, uh, in the network, and uh, if let's say you are make a, uh, if you're deploying for your own application, and you don't want to sort of like deploy gateway devices or not to worry about uh, maintaining them, so there are companies now that are deploying the, these gateway devices at a very large scale across the world, and uh, and. Uh, and this allows you to just buy a LoRa transmitter, take subscription from these companies, and then you can upload the sensor data to the cloud without you having to worry about deploying these gateway devices. So two such companies are uh, Helium and uh, the Things Network. And if you look at, for example, their deployment, so this is the scale of uh, Things Network. It's across the world and it's very den densely uh, deployed their gateway devices. And this number is just increasing uh, every day. So in this particular instance, there were about 66,000 gateways that were sort of like uh, available uh, across the world at this uh, particular uh, time instance. Similarly, if you look at Helium, which has combined some of uh, the LoRa end devices with the uh, uh, sort of their own cryptocurrency. Uh, it also has a very large deployment and in, uh, in the, both the United States as well as uh, uh, different parts of the Europe. And even uh, if you look at India, there there are uh, these clusters uh, that you can see that uh, demonstrate that these uh, helium gateways are uh, quite deployed uh, in the different parts of the world. So all of these actually allow you to sort of like deploy uh, LoRa networks without having to spend a lot of time to deploy these gateway devices. And it can also allow your, uh, to, for you to sort of like scale your network and, uh, and, uh, and, and, deploy, and get important sensor information without having to worry about maintaining this infrastructure. So with this, we come to an end of this part of the lecture. Thank you.